Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 509th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Hello, everyone. I want to take a few minutes to talk to you about how we make the Urban Farm Podcast come to life. My team and I pour our time, hearts, and dollars into every episode to bring you food growing education and inspiration every week. And we love doing it. I see firsthand how food growing changes people's lives for the better. And I've made it my mission to spread the knowledge far and wide. By creating this podcast, I have the great privilege of interviewing some absolutely amazing people and providing a platform for you to learn from their experiences and expertise. The impact that this work has on the global food consciousness community is extraordinary. This is all thanks to my team and their efforts, five of us that work every week to find guests, set up interviews, write out questions, prepare show notes, edit episodes, and more. We've tried partnering with companies and running ads to pay for our work, but something about the ad model just doesn't feel right to me. If I'm advocating for something, I want it to be something I truly love and believe in. So I've decided to try a different model, one that I believe is possible to pay our team and bring even more value while keeping the podcast free and accessible to everyone. So instead of selling ads, we have created the Urban Farm Podcast Patron Program. If you find value in our podcast, you can go even deeper by becoming a member of our patron community. In exchange for subscribing, you will receive content and bonuses far beyond the free podcast episodes we offer. No matter what level you subscribe at, I'm committed to making sure the value you receive goes far beyond what you contribute. Did you know that the Urban Farm podcast is not my first. Over a decade ago, my friend Amy and I hosted the Freshly Green podcast, 50 episodes of Everything Green. As an Urban Farm podcast patron, you will get access to them, plus cool things such as discounts on Urban Farm U online courses and access to our private Facebook community where you can interact with other food growers and share stories and advice. My favorite offering for our patrons is our monthly Q&As with Urban Farm U's Advanced Gardener Team, where we answer your questions live. It's basically having your own private gardener at your fingertips. I'm excited for the mutual exchange that comes from this model. And when you support the Urban Farm podcast, we support you to take your garden to the next level and beyond. The Urban Farm Podcast will remain free, and I hope that those of you that believe in what we're doing and are excited by our patron benefits will take advantage of what we're offering. I truly believe this model of support will be a win-win all around. For more details about member benefits and to sign up to pledge your support, go to urbanfarmpodcast.org. Thanks for sticking with me through this message. Now let's get to the episode. Today on our podcast, we have someone who is giving nature a helping hand by restoring vegetation. We're talking with Dr. Elise Gornish about seed balls. Elise is a cooperative extension specialist in ecological restoration at the University of Arizona. Her research and outreach program focuses largely on identifying strategies for successful restoration in arid land systems and integration of restoration approaches into weed management. Originally from New York, she received her MS and PhD from Florida State University in 2013. She then completed two years of postdoc work at the University of California, Davis, before becoming a cooperative extension specialist in ecological restoration at UC Davis. Then in 2017, she moved to Tucson, Arizona and the University of Arizona. Seed ball superhero Elise is an early career leader in fields of arid land restoration and weed management and has published over 40 papers and presented over 150 times in various venues on the topic. Welcome to the show today, Elise. Are you ready to rock seed balls? You bet I am. Awesome. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Sure. So I 
originally didn't start at all in science. I wasn't a very good student. I didn't think I liked science. I'm pretty good with people, so I actually did um, English and business in my undergrad. And I worked really hard for that because I guess I thought that was where I should go because, you know, you make a lot of money in business and yep. that was As a student who didn't do very well in the sciences, I thought that was a great way to go. And um, I actually got a job in marketing in the fashion industry. And after working there a year, I was like, this is not at all interesting. And I was kind of bummed because I worked really hard in undergrad to do these two degrees, English and business. And all of a sudden, I found myself at 21 in a job I wasn't happy with. So I took out a piece of paper and actually wrote down everything I liked to do because I figured I could sort of make a list of things and try to get a job that compassed most of the stuff on that list. And there was a lot of stuff on that list, like be outside, be alone, be around animals. And I was like, oh, this sounds like, I don't know, a forest ranger or something, because I didn't really know anything about ecology or science in general. And I started Googling and, you know, ecology kept coming up in Google. And I was like, what is this thing? So I started learning about it. And I was like, maybe ecology is this path? I don't know. And so to try to start learning about that, I continued working full time, but I got an internship at the Central Park Zoo. So I was living in New York City. Wow. I got an internship at the Museum of Natural History. Yeah, because I figured like this was the way you kind of dip your toe into it. And that internship at the Museum of Natural History actually turned into three summers of field work in the Canadian Arctic, working with snow geese and polar bears. And after wow. that, I was like, oh my God, this is super dope. So <laughs> I realized I really liked working outside and being alone. And I realized if I wanted to sort of get in the field of ecology, then upper level degrees would work. So I started going back to school during the day. I got a job at a bar at night making way more money than I ever did uh, working full time. Right. And I got all the classes I needed done. And then I went to Florida and did my PhD and realized I loved field ecology. And I really liked plants because plants don't try to eat you like polar bears do. And people don't care if you kill plants so you can kind of manipulate them. And I really liked working with people. And really importantly, I realized that I I wanted to do something that was valuable for people. I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but, you know, a lot of science is really important for under understanding sort of fundamental dynamics of, of biology and ecology. And scientists do these experiments and they write papers that goes into the ether of science that other scientists read, but I wasn't interested in that. I wanted to do something that was valuable for people managing land or making something better. So that's why I sort of pursued this applied ecological management track. And here I am. Wow. And you've been concentrating on seed balls. Yeah. So I work in, I live in Tucson, Arizona. And so all of my work focuses on very arid systems. So desert systems that usually receive, you know, like 10 inches or less of rain. So restoration and vegetation management in these systems is really, really hard. Restoration particularly is hard because All the things that kind of keep a seed from becoming a plant, mostly that's driven by rain, and we don't get a lot of rain here. And so seed balls are these this approach, this technique that is really cheap to implement. It's logistically easy to kind of put together and put out, and it could overcome all of the problems associated with sort of uh, limitations of restoration in arid systems. And so I'm really interested in trying to develop this idea, even though the idea has been around forever. Wow. And where'd you come up with this idea at? Well, so sea balls have been used in agriculture for, forever. And actually, in the 1940s, a dentist in the United States was like, hey, why don't we use seed balls? They were, it was only used in agriculture. He was like, why don't we use seed balls for restoration? How a dentist came up with this, I, I don't know. And I right? haven't been able to find that history. It's so weird. But a dentist came up with it and somehow convinced the United States government to start using seed balls for large-scale restoration in the Southwest. And it actually failed spectacularly for lots of reasons. And then seed balls kind of fell out of vogue until the 1980s where hippies started getting really into seed bombing or seed balling areas with no native plants. So you make seed balls and you can throw them places and it's called like guerrilla gardening. And I started, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I started reading about guerrilla gardening and I came across this book that I think is really interesting that I'll talk about later. But, and I read a couple of articles about the use of seed balls and restoration and I thought, 
this is such an awesome idea. Why, why aren't more people using it? And I started talking to more practitioners, and there's certainly restoration practitioners, so people on the ground that have been kind of using seed balls as ad hoc, but in the sort of research arena, efforts to formalize the approach to, to make it better have really not gained traction. So I decided, hey, this is the perfect, it's shown to be really beneficial. It would be really easy for folks to employ. So why don't we try to sort of delve into the approach and, and develop it in a way that it's more useful and successful for restoration. Wow. So let's tease apart what you do. You're a restoration management specialist. Specialist? Yeah, so I'm a cooperative extension specialist, which essentially means that I need to go to the stakeholders of the state of Arizona. So that's land managers, that can be people in the Nature Conservancy for Audubon, that could be government, so land managers of BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, or the Forest Service, anybody who's interested in managing and protecting and conserving landscapes. And that can be working landscapes like ranches, or that can be natural landscapes that are not used for agriculture. And I go to them and I say, what do you need? And when they tell me what they need in terms of research information, then I do that research. So my research is stakeholder driven. So I do the research. Yeah, it's the best job ever, literally. So I do the research and then I deliver the other part of my program that's really important is the outreach. So then I deliver that information back to the stakeholders. So, you know, I'll do experiments to try to identify some of these answers that stakeholders need. And sure, I'll write up the um, results and send it to a journal that other scientists will read. But stakeholders do not read peer-reviewed journals. They don't read science and nature for the most part, and they don't have time for it. And so what they need is that information provided to them in a way that is accessible to them. So I give a lot of talks to folks in special interest groups like rancher groups, or I'll go to management meetings, or I'll write briefs and put them out on blogs or Twitter or publish them in special interest magazines, places that stakeholders can actually access this information. Wow. And so how are you overlaying seed balls with the stakeholders and in this conversation? So essentially, anytime a lot of the stakeholders around here uh, are really interested in enhancing biodiversity as well as reducing erosion um, mm. or soil loss. Right. And I work actually with a lot of ranchers, and a lot of ranchers are interested in how they can enhance forage availability. So traditionally how this is done is you buy a bunch of seed and you throw it out and then the seed germinates and it grows and there you go. You've got wildlife habitat, you've got forage. But around here, if you throw a naked seed down on the ground, you're essentially burning money. Like yeah. that seed is just not going to germinate. Good luck it's with not that. germinate because it'll blow away or animals will eat it or the seed will die from desiccation stress because it's just so hot here. And so, you know, stakeholders would never say to me, I'm interested in seed balls. What they would say is, I'm interested in finding ways that I can enhance enhance forage that's successful. I'm interested in enhancing wildlife habitat. How do I do that? And so what I do is I collaborate with a lot of these folks. So with a lot of the ranchers, we'll actually do on-ranch tests. So we'll use seed balls and we'll compare that to using naked seed and we'll compare that to actually planting plugs of little little established plants. And we'll look at how those different strategies work in terms of achieving their goals. So actually providing wildlife habitat or forage. And we'll also balance that with how much it actually costs. And so I take the needs of the the stakeholders and then I attempt to address that often using seed balls because I think that that will help them on their property. And so they become a collaborator in that project and they're invested in that project because we're trying to, you know, address their problem and overcome their challenges. Wow. You've done a beautiful job of taking what I understood to be a hippie concept and making it mainstream for ranchers. Good on you. Yeah. Well, because I, yeah, I first heard about seed balls in my permaculture design course in 1991 when I took it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back then, most of the people taking permaculture design courses were, were hippies. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so bringing that into this mainstream, that's pretty dang cool. Yeah. And I think, you know, what's really important for me is designing strategies that are logistically feasible. Like if I'm doing something that I am somehow able to design an approach for restoration or for gardening and it 
enhances success 100%. Well, that's wonderful, but if it's something that's too expensive for anyone to actually be able to pay for or it's too logistically infeasible, it doesn't matter if it's this perfect strategy. People aren't going to be able to use it. So that's why I really think seed balls have a lot of utility for stakeholders because it's really simple. It's a simple design, so anyone can do it. A backyard gardener can do it. The BLM can do it. Anyone can do it, and it's pretty inexpensive. And so that's why I'm really focusing on it, and that's why I think that's why I try to push it for folks to consider it sort of in their vegetation management strategies. People can do this in their backyards as well. They can do it in their backyards, yeah. People can make seed balls in their sinks, you know. One of the limitations of seed balls is that if you make them by hand, they're super easy to make by hand, but it can take a long time to make a lot of them. And so certainly for a small project, an acre or less, or for backyard gardening, it's super easy to make them by hand and it works. If you want to do anything beyond that, you're going to have to develop sort of a machine to mechanically make them quickly. And that's why my lab has developed this bicycle that you can actually make thousands of seed balls in like five minutes. Wow. All right, we'll get there in a minute. Okay. What? So I've, I, let's just imagine for a moment that I have a seed ball in my hand. What am I looking at? And logistically, how does it work? A seed ball is essentially a structure that's composed primarily of seed, a little bit of water, clay, and soil. There can actually be tons of different ingredients. I've seen seed balls with cat litter, with rock dust, with uh, activated charcoal, but in general, it's seed, soil, and clay, and a little bit of water. And what that package does is the clay sort of holds everything together and keeps it dry, and the soil provides a little bit of nutrients. And the seed ball structure then is able to overcome all the limitations of traditional restoration. So if you throw down naked seed on the ground, that seed might blow away somewhere. So the seed ball, because there's a lot of other components in it, sort of weighs it down so it keeps the seed from blowing away. If you throw naked seed down on the ground, um, often you're going to get a lot of seed loss to granivores or animals that eat seed. Right. That can be, you know, mice or ants. I mean, ants can move like hundreds of thousands of seed in less than a day. We're not talking about losing one or two. And so usually when you have seeds in seed ball, they're in the interior of the seed ball. They're not as attractive to granivores. Additionally, you get a lot of seed loss through desiccation stress. So if you throw seed down on the ground and it doesn't rain, those seeds might die from desiccation stress. So because the seeds are in the interior of the seed ball, usually they're protected from that. So all those limitations to success restoration are kind of overcome with the seed ball. And once it rains or once there's enough germinating rain, the clay you use will melt away and it will leave this little puddle of a little bit of soil and seed. The seed starts germinating and then you have this little tiny puddle of soil to uh, for nutrients to enhance right. the establishment of that seed. Yeah. Wow. Okay, cool. So if I was going to make some in my sink, how would I do that? Oh, so it's super easy. So all you need is a little bit of seed, and usually you want to use native seed. You need a little bit of fire clay, which you can buy at any art store, and it's actually super inexpensive. You can get like a giant bag for five bucks. And then you want soil or compost, and usually it's one part seed to three parts nutrients or soil or compost to five Mm -hmm. parts clay. And you just mix it all up, and then you add a little bit of water, and then see if you can pack the seed in a little seed ball. Usually you want the seed ball to be about an inch in circumference. Right. And then if it's not packing together, if it's still kind of flaky, then you add a little bit more water. And then once you can pack those seed balls together, you make the seed ball, and then you let it dry for about three days, and then they're ready to go. And you can put them out any time. If it's like, so in Arizona, it rains in the summer, and it rains in the winter. But if it's September, and the rains have stopped... You can still throw out the seed ball and seed balls and they'll be fine waiting for the winter rain. So that's another really cool aspect of seed balls is you're not quite a slave to weather as you are when you're doing typical restoration. When you're using naked seed, it's critical when it rains when you put your seed down. But for seed balls, it's a little less important because those seeds will be protected in that seed ball until it rains. Awesome. And Mm -hmm. you've invented, created, put together a bicycle powered version of this that you referenced earlier. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I I didn't invent it. That would be awesome if I did, but I'm not that cool. Actually, one of my grad students, Ashley Simpson, she was at the U of A. She's now in Flagstaff, but she worked for an organization called Borderlands Restoration, and they invented the seed bike. And essentially what the seed bike does is it mechanizes the process of seed ball production. So essentially it's a seed bike hooked up to a giant drum. And when you're riding the seed bike, you put all of the materials into the drum 
drum, and the movement of the drum kind of mixes the materials together. And as the materials mix, they mix, and then you put some water in, and they start sticking. But also the movement of the drum, the stuck material sort of falls and breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces. So you can make, I mean, I've made thousands of seed balls in like six minutes. Wow. And so we, yeah, we developed a guide of how to make these bikes. So we developed the guide. And then we showed the guide to a bunch of engineers. So we have gotten input from engineers. And you can easily make one of these bikes for about 160 bucks for, you know, the wood and the bike and the drum. And most of that's actually for the drum. Uh-huh. And this bike, you can take it apart and move it places. You can have it on your farm. You can have it in your backyard. Um, we have two bikes, and I regularly sort of demonstrate the bike at all kinds of farm shows and things like that. And so, yeah, you can go on to my website, and there's a free download of the guide. Anyone can use it. We'd love to hear how people use it. The uh, Forest Service has made one, and they're using it to make seed balls for post-fire restoration, which is super awesome. Wow. And what kind of seeds can you put in seed balls? You can put in any kind of seed. So one of the sort of more practical purposes of seed balls is that it coats the seeds. So seeds look you know, really different. They've got all kinds of things on them. And a lot of grass seed have these long ons on them. So these like sort of long pieces. Yes. And often for commercial restoration, um, when you're putting seeds out, you're using these machines to kind of drop the seeds into furrows. And often those long ons will get stuck in those machines. Mm. So if you make seed balls, it kind of covers up the ons and it's easier for mechanized distribution. So you can use any kind of seeds for these seed balls. You can use seed mixes, you can use mon- cultures, whatever you want, and yeah, whatever kind of seeds you want. We, one of the sort of limitations of seed balls is there hasn't been much formal experimentation to understand sort of ideal design. So that's something we're trying to get to. Like, is it better to have bigger seed balls for bigger seeded species? I don't know. So we're testing that. Is it better to have bigger seed balls if you have a more diverse mix of species? I don't know. So we're testing that. So right now I can't tell you sort of the ideal seed ball design. And on my website, I also have sort of a general um, instructional handout of how to make seed balls. And that's based on how a lot of different people do it. But we haven't actually tested a lot of those strategies because that research just isn't there yet. So that's stuff that my my lab is doing. But for now, I've used woody species in seed balls. I've used grasses. I've used forbs. I've used seed mixes. And they all seem to work. We're going to shift here in a minute, but I have a question for you. We seem to have a really gnarly weed problem here in the state called uh, stinkweed or Mm -hmm. globe chamomile, I think. Mm -hmm. That's what they call it. What do you know about that? Globe chamomile is kind of new, a new invader, or it's been around for a little while, but it's it's fairly new. Um, I've heard of the common name is stink net. Oh, and yes, it's yes. It's problematic because it's it's really short. It expands its range really quickly, and it looks it's a flower, and that's always harder to get rid of flowering weeds because people are like, oh, look at that, that's beautiful. Why would we want to get rid of that? And it's moving through the state really quickly on roadsides. And that's usually, that's that's often how weeds go around the state. So it's super problematic, and it hasn't been identified as a weed by a lot of land managers yet. Uh-huh. There's sort of stakeholders or individuals in the state that know the local plants really well, and so they realize it's a weed. But, you know, convincing the BLM to spend a lot of money to spray areas or, you know, things like that are, is hard, <laughs> and yeah. it's slow. Well, and one of the one of the things is is that it doesn't respond to the typical herbicides. Yeah, I saw a talk recently from someone who has been using a collection of herbicides that now I cannot remember. Uh, I wish I did, but um, there are people who are sort of ad hoc testing yeah. herbicide types, and it does respond to some herbicides. So that is good. But in terms of weeds, one of the problems both here in Arizona and sort of elsewhere is that a lot of folks think, okay, if you've got some weeds, you either spray it or you burn it or you put cows on it and you get rid of it in a patch and then you can walk away. And basic sort of invasion ecology tells you that if you have a bare patch, it's going to get recolonized by weeds. And so 
you know, one of my goals for my career, I guess, is to get people to also think about restoration when they think about herbicide or burning or, or grazing for weeds. Because if you don't get something else down on the ground, that area will be reinvaded. And so seed balls, I'm doing a lot of tests with seed balls in invaded areas to see if they're effective uh-huh. and how effective they are when you either get rid of a weed through spraying or grazing or fire. If you add seed balls, does it enhance invasion resilience or resistance. So does it keep that invasive from coming back into that bare area that you just nuked? Or if you just throw some seed balls down in a in an untreated area that has a monoculture of an invasive, is that an effective way to get, get a foothold of some natives in a site? So we're just starting those experiments. So I don't I, I think it's gonna work, but I don't have any data to back that up. So we could talk in a couple years about that. There you go. Well so here's a piece of data. I don't know how relevant it is. I have Bermuda grass in my yard and and yeah, exactly. That, that is a weed, and especially in my gardens. One of the things that I noticed is that I have some mulberries. So I have a primarily edible food forest where I live here in Phoenix. So I planted some mm-hmm. mulberry bushes and it's shading out the Bermuda grass. So I'm, my mm-hmm. thought was is that the same thing would happen with invasives. If you shaded them out, maybe they that would have a negative impact on them? Yeah. So a lot of invasives, particularly in super arid systems, they require 100% sun. So around where I am in southeast Arizona, if you go out on rangelands and you look at the mesquite, for example, if you look under mesquite, Uh you do not find layman's lovegrass, which is a particularly problematic grass, invasive grass around here. You find a lot of natives. Oh, yes. So not only is it the shade, but there's aspects of sort of heterogeneity that you need. So so differences in that landscape um, that give the natives a foothold. So I think, yeah, having natives out there will serve to reduce the amount of invasives, both because you're sort of modifying an aspect in the environment, so shade, plus you're providing a area that the natives can take in a foothold. So probably under those mulberry trees that you've got, mm-hmm. in a little while, you'll find some natives coming up and taking sort of refuge in those areas. And once you get established natives, usually they're not pushed out by invasives. Invasives usually take over bare areas or areas where you have injured or weak natives from fire or something like that. Wow. So it's probably a good idea to use native seeds primarily in these seed bulbs. Yes. I'm almost always a proponent of native only. However, there are situations where non-native species might be helpful. So for example, I did a lot of work in the Great Basin and hundreds of thousands of acres of the Great Basin is invaded by cheatgrass. So Bromus tectorum, it's a super aggressive, invasive annual grass from the Mediterranean. And it is dang near impossible to get any natives going in cheatgrass-dominated landscapes, even if you spray them out. Like, we think that the cheatgrass is actually modifying something in the soil. Uh And so in the Great Basin, what we found is that some of the only species you can use for restoration or at least uh, displacing the cheatgrass is a grass called crested wheatgrass. And that is a non-native, but it's not an aggressive invasive plant. Uh It physiologically is very similar to a lot of the natives. Animals like to eat it. It can provide resistance against fire. And so in that case, there's been a lot of work out in the Great Basin that has shown that that's one of the only species you can use to sort of restore or replace cheese grass. So I think that there are some situations where using non-natives can be helpful and might be one of your only uh, choices in at least a progress or a process of restoration. You know, down the road, once you get rid of a lot of the cheatgrass and you replace it with this crested wheatgrass, then we can think about replacing the crested wheatgrass with something else. But I think for backyard gardening or areas where you don't have 100% dominance of a non-native, then using native-only species is the way to go. It's a good idea. Awesome. Yeah. And so how do people find out about your work and uh, get a copy of this cool bicycle-powered seed pelletizer? <laughs> So people can go to my website, which is gornish.arizona.edu. I mean, if you Google my name, there's only one Elise Gornish on the planet, I believe. And Uh so my website will come up. I also very, very frequently post on Twitter. And so if you want to follow me on Twitter, my name is RestoreCal, R-E-S-T-O-R-E-C-A-L. 
and those are two ways to find out both what I'm doing as well as get information about sort of restoration, mostly in the Southwest in general. Excellent. So I'm going to shift on you and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed how you overcame that failure and what you might have learned from it. When I first started in grad school, I was working on a restoration project in a dune system. I was working on St. George Island in Apalachicola Bay in Florida, it's uh-huh. a beautiful, beautiful barrier island. And a lot of the barrier islands in the Gulf have been destroyed from years of hurricanes. So I was doing this post-hurricane restoration study, and we found that there were a bunch of different plant species that are effective for restoration, and I wrote it up in a peer-reviewed journal, and I was very proud of myself. And then I called the manager out at the site that we've been working with, and I said, hey, did you see my paper? And he goes, no. And I was like, oh, well, you know, I I did this, you know, the whole study, we finished it, and we have all these results. And and he's like, okay, well, I I don't have time to read that paper. So I said, oh, no no worries, I'll I'll send you a little overview of it. I'm really proud of myself that, you know, I'm talking to the stakeholder, and I write up this little overview of the study, and I send it to him. And, you know, I call him a couple weeks later. I'm like, so what'd you think? And he's like, well, this is great, but, you know, half the species you used, you can't find in commercial nurseries here. And so we'd never be able to use them in restoration. And I was like, oh, and you know, what I realized is we had totally ignored the stakeholder. We had worked with the manager because we needed access and stuff, but we never sat down with him and said, what species do you think would be useful? What species do you want to see out here? We were a couple of academics who came in and we were like, oh no, we're going to use data and we're going to figure this out and knee pat, knee pat. We'll, we'll tell you what's best. (laughs) Right. So I, (laughs) that was a major failure because that paper that work is is useful in some sense for scientists, but is not going to be useful for any managers to actually do any restoration because a lot of the plants we use, you can't get unless you go to these damaged areas and collect seed. And that there's a there's a whole host of problems that can be associated with that. So it was a major learning experience, and that was the beginning of my journey of understanding like you you can't do effective land management or learn or do effective applied ecology unless you have stakeholder buy-in and understanding and collaboration from the beginning. Amen to that. Yeah. Those are the people who live and work in those systems and they know more than I can ever learn or know from those systems. And so that has been sort of a big guiding light of my work ever since. And that's why I had always wanted to get into cooperative extension from that because you get all the benefits of working in academia, but you're also sort of required to work with stakeholders. And so I know my work is relevant because I do it with stakeholders. Nice. Yeah. I have a master's degree in urban planning, urban and environmental Mm -hmm. planning from Arizona State University in 2006. And they pounded that one into us. It's Uh like, yes, you may be great at what you do. You may know what you're talking about when it comes from a planning perspective, but you have to work with the stakeholders. Yeah. And you know, I, I think that this is a, a sort of a larger problem in science in general. So there's a major problem of sort of science communication to non-scientists. And maybe it's because a lot of people who get into science, we're all kind of weird and quirky and like, don't like, <laughs> we're not very good at talking with people in general, but we're also never, ever taught how to do that. You know, there was no class in how you provide a presentation to non-scientists ever. There's no class on how you talk to non-scientists. And so sometimes when I talk to other researchers and they're like, oh, you're talking to non-scientists? Like, how do you dumb down the science? And I'm like, excuse me, I don't dumb down anything. It's just, it's a different language. And that's not dumbing down. You know, if I'm going to talk to someone in Spanish, I'm going to speak to them in Spanish, not English. I'm not dumbing it down. I'm talking in their language. And so, for example, if I talk to ranchers, often I don't use the words climate change. I use the words drought. Drought is associated with climate change. It is climate change. But ranchers use the term drought, and that's what they know. And so that's the word I'm using. And it's not dumbing it down at all. That's the language they're using. Yeah. And to suggest that you're dumbing down things when you're talking to people who know way more about a system than you do <laughs> right? is super offensive. And I think that yeah. that's a, a major reason why we're having a problem with people understanding climate change. You know, you, you've got these scientists that come to public meetings and they talk down to people and people do not like, nobody likes to be talked down to. And if that happens, people aren't going to listen to you. And so, you know, I've learned many times over that way more people know way more about what I'm doing than I do. And so if I just listen to folks, I will learn a lot more and, you know, people appreciate that. And then I'm able to provide more useful science for them because I'm listening to them. But it, it's a major problem in science in general, I think. Yeah. Well, that, you know, that goes to the old adage. You've got two ears and one mouth. Yeah. yeah. Right? 
Yeah. Just listen twice yeah. as mu- listen twice as much as you talk. Yeah, that I, I wish that that message was more pervasive in in science. But yeah. So, what do you consider your biggest success? <laughs> I think my biggest success is been having a a daughter and raising her so far and she's healthy and happy and that's good but I think sort of maintaining my productivity with having a child and being able to figure out sort of work life balance seems kind of corny but it's having a kid no, is really that's, hard oh yeah uh, I can imagine yeah and having you know and and maintaining sort of productivity at work I'm expected to bring in hundreds of thousand dollars in grants and write lots of papers and meet with stakeholders and drive around the state and do all this science and um, run a lab and have students and do all this stuff. And it's a, it's a lot of work, but I've been able to sort of maintain, in fact, enhance and, and better my work-life balance. And so that's pretty awesome. And just this year, actually, I was awarded an early career fellow from the Ecological Society of America. So that's pretty dope. Wow. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. So what drives you? There's two very different things that drive me. One is doing science that I know is helping people in their livelihood. And that might seem a little grandiose, but I work directly with stakeholders. And when we can figure out a way together to do something that helps them ranch or helps them keep invasives off their landscape, that's a major win. And that makes me feel really good because I I can see it out there. I'm doing the experiment with these folks and I'm seeing that it's working. And I see that people actually start adopting these approaches and these technologies in their regular lives. And they're telling other people after we started making these seed balls and and deploying a lot of seed experiments and we started seeing that these seed balls were working, I would get calls from other ranchers or I would get calls from the Forest Service and people would say, like, you know, I heard about this and I heard that it's working. We want to try it on our landscape. And that is amazing. That's huge. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it just makes me feel good. The other thing that drives me is I'm, I'm really interested in inclusion in science and enhancing sort of accessibility of science to everyone. Science still really is a good old boys club. There's a lot of old white men in it, and a lot of these guys have done really great stuff. But, you know, when people think about scientists, they think about old white men in lab coats. And then if they're not a white man, they might think, oh, science isn't for me. And so... Diversity and inclusion is really important to me, and that drives me because I, I want to show people that anyone can do science. I mean, anyone can do science. I didn't even do well in, in science in my classes up until college, and so and here I am. So one of the other things I do in my job is I'm the director of a program called GALS, which is Girls on Outdoor Adventure for Leadership and Science, and it's uh-huh. a program that takes high school girls from underserved communities out into the backcountry for a week. The program is totally free. And we just teach them wow. some science concepts, but we enhance sort of leadership and confidence building skills. And these girls go on this trip and they're without their parents. They're with some undergrad and grad leaders who are women and they learn about soil and they learn about desert fishes and they learn about hiking and they learn about themselves and feminism and all this stuff. And they come back different women and they come back saying things like, I, I want to go to college now. These are girls that might not have wanted to go to college. They come back saying things like, yeah, I am smart enough to do this. And that's super important. And so this is the second year of the program, and it's it's an amazing program. So people can also find out about that program on my website. That is super epic. Good job. Yeah, it is epic. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, that moved me a little bit when you were sharing that. Thank you for that. Yeah. If you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? Okay, I'm going to be a cheater because I've got two books. All right, Um, perfect. So the first book, um, there's a book by a a Japanese farmer. Um, He died not too long ago, but he wrote essentially the book on using seed balls for agriculture, but mostly for restoration. It's called The One Straw Revolution, Mm -hmm. and the Mm -hmm. author's name is Masanobu Fukuoka. And so he's written a couple books, but The One Straw Revolution is this awesome book about sort of caring for the land and using nature to guide you on how you care for the land. And that was this, you know, I was learning about seed balls and this book came up over and over and over. And I think anyone interested in seed balls should read it. As an aside, I also think everyone should read Dune by Frank Herbert. So (laughs) Dune is one of my favorite books of all time, Let the Spice Flow. And it's actually an awesome book that indirectly talks about sort of ecology and colonialism and you know, how we maintain arid landscapes and natural resources and all these awesome things. I would 
really urge people to not watch the movies because the Dune movies are laughably terrible. But Dune, the book, and the original Dune, Frank Herbert's son wrote a couple of follow-ups, and they're they're all right. But the original Dune is the best book, one of the, my top books ever written. So nice. I feel the same way about Ender's Game. Oh, uh, Orson and, oh Card, Ender's Card. Game is so good. Yeah. I, Orson Scott Card, that guy is. So, yeah, Ender's Game is amazing. Yeah. When it, you know, the, it sounds. I I read Dune a long time ago. And from what I remember, it it does. They do a lot of social cultural work oh, yeah. in the books. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And there's this huge. I mean, you can read it just as you know this cool sci-fi book, and and it's great. But yeah, reading it with being cognizant of sort of the social ecological undertones that are that permeate every story and every character in the whole book is just it, it's a different experience. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's, cool. It's, it's such a good book. What one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? So my piece of advice in terms of seed balls and land management is that, you know, a lot of things are kind of going bad <laughs> on earth. There, there's a lot of problems and everyone has the capacity to actually make change. You know, a lot of the talks I give about climate change and, and restoration, I start with a lot of bummers. You know, I remind people how lots of bad things are happening and the world is changing. But I always remind people that, you know, in the 80s, the, the, there was a hole in the ozone layer and a lot of people took it very seriously. And together, people made collective decisions to stop buying aerosol spray products. Yep. And businesses had to respond to that, okay? It wasn't that Aquanet just stopped making aerosol hairspray because the ozone, there was a hole in the ozone. People stopped buying Aquanet and Aquanet had to modify the product. And so people have the capacity to make change. The, the hole in the ozone is essentially closed now. And that is because of collective decision-making by people. People just decide, I'm going to stop buying aerosol spray products. So Every time people start getting bummed out about climate change and and the enhanced fires and people dying because of fires and, and enhanced weeds and we're losing species and all this stuff that's very terrible and very real and very caused by people, I like to remind people that everyone has the capacity to make changes. And it might seem like you're one person and it's a small thing, but really we've done it before in the past and it's possible to do it now. And if you decide, you know, you want to stop eating meat twice a week, great. If you want to, you know, stop using straws, great. If you want to buy a Nissan Leaf, great, do it. But just making a decision, people have that capacity to do it. And just in terms of science, I would say if you, you know, if there's anyone listening out there that's in high school or below and they might think science is not for them, okay, you know, maybe you're not interested in science, but science permeates every part of our world and it is totally for you and you are capable and smart and you can do it. And if you're interested, you can get into science and you can make a difference with what you want to study. So. Just like you did. Yeah. Yeah. I had terrible grades and look at me. I've got a PhD now. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, thank mm-hmm. you so much for joining us on the show today, Rockstar Elise. <laughs> Rockstar and superhero. I love it. How can our listeners get a hold of you? They can go to the website. All my um, contact information is there. And again, if they don't remember the website, which is gornish.arizona.edu, you can just put my name into Google. I'm the only Elise Gornish. Um, and please follow me on Twitter. I tweet tons of awesome often uplifting stuff and daily. So Excellent, excellent. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash seed balls. Hey, if you've enjoyed this podcast and are interested in listening to my first podcast series, Freshly Green from 2007, you can subscribe to support the Urban Farm Podcast. With that, you will have access to Freshly Green and so much more bonus content. Visit urbanfarmpodcast.org to find out more and to pledge your support. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.